Thanks, Andrew. Uh, again, my name is Rob Adams. I'm, I'll be up here <clears throat> for about the next hour. I'll probably open up for some Q&A. And first of all, let, let me tell you why I'm here and how I think I might be able to help um, in the context of what is happening here in Knoxville. Um, I've started many companies over the course of my life, uh, actually about a half a dozen, some of which were extremely successful and some of which were incredible holes in the ground with large dollar signs attached. So I, I've done this before. Um, I've also run a venture fund that focused on early stage investing, which is critical, um, but something that's hard to do these days. So I'm very familiar with some of the things you face both here in, in eastern Tennessee as well as, frankly, companies face across the U.S. and around the world with financing of early stage opportunities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So I'm one of, I'm one of the few people who has had experience, as I would say, signing both sides of the check, both endorsing the check for deposit and signing the check for investment. Um, and I'm here to show you what I have found is about the most uh, consistent attribute of success I've been able to, to work out in order to help make a company work. Uh, I'm going to talk about the odds of it working, which are not particularly optimistic, and sort of show why you need a lot of grit as an entrepreneur. But I'm also going to take you some, through some of the techniques that actually can be used to, to increase the probability of success. And the one thing I guarantee you is um, you're going to be outside your comfort zone. I'm going to tell you some stuff you don't want to hear. I'm going to tell you some stuff you've got to do to be successful. Um, and if you find it too tedious or you're unwilling to do it, I'll save you a whole lot of time and effort now. Don't go into entrepreneurship. So uh, I, I, I'm known for telling it like it is. Um, the other thing is the content I am going to cover with you today is actually in the book, If You Build It, Will They Come? Many of them are outside for sale for $15. Um, so if you're interested in what you hear here and what I talk about, it's, it's covered in, uh, with different examples and in great detail in that book. So for those of you who are technical and always wondered about how marketing really works and how you can figure out if there's demand for your product, I'm going to show you. For those of you who are strategy-oriented or marketing-oriented, I'm going to show you how to get the data behind things. Uh, the other thing I'm going to tell you, if you are technical, you're probably used to perfecting your product. And if it's a mechanical product, load testing it. If it's an electronic pr product, quality assuring it. And most technical people and most companies overproduce on the quality side of the product, but put nowhere near the same level of effort in understanding what the customer really wants and what the market opportunity is. So that's what I'm going to cover with you today, OK? And the, the main point, before we even get started here, is companies don't fail for technical product reasons. They simply don't. Companies fail because no one will give them money for what they've built. Now, we heard a lot about investors, and we had, we had some entrepreneurs up here, and we heard about venture capital. And if your idea is compelling and you can prove it, you will get a little bit of capital. But you've got to start selling it really quickly. And no investor is going to fund your science project while you thrash around trying to figure out where the market is. Okay? There are easier ways for them to make money. As was said, they're in the business of selling hot dogs. If you can't figure out how to sell hot dogs on a fairly short order, don't expect the checks to keep coming. It's real cut and dry, and it's really simple. So if you're a startup, your first product or service has to work in the market. You have to have something that customers will open up their wallet and pay money for. And these market problems have three characteristics. The first is, the need is ubiquitous in some target audience. It's not just you have the problem, or your friends have the problem, or your immediate circle of friends have the problem. It's a ubiquitous, repeatable problem. Second thing that's critical to a market opportunity is I need a high sense of urgency, particularly in today's economic times. The analogy I like to use is my hair is on fire urgent. Okay, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something immediately. 
Third key thing, people have to be willing to pay money to fix the problem, okay? So three attributes to start with, ubiquity, high sense of urgency, and willing to pay. So let's start with that as a context. What I'm going to talk to you about is the typical company today that is a startup goes out to market with what I call a fire, 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 ready, aim process. They build what they think they, the market needs. They build what the founder thinks they need. They build what the engineers think is needed. But it has absolutely no basis in reality. It's a bunch of people sitting inside in an office, probably with a whiteboard, thinking they're really, and I'm sure they are working really, really hard, coming up with a technically perfect something or other that nobody wants. So what I'm going to do is turn this process around. Instead of coming up with the technical stuff first, and then throwing in the market and hoping it works, I'm going to show you how to figure out the market problem first and then figure out what the technology is to back it up. So you've heard frequently that investors invest in teams. Absolutely true. They invest in teams that have found compelling market opportunities. They know a smart team with a good opportunity will find some competitive advantage. You heard about that from our previous speakers, too. Some competitive advantage, competitive differentiation in the market that will help them succeed, OK? Technology is not competitive advantage if there's no market attached to it. So find the market problem, get some smart people, then find the technology that gives you some way to do it better, faster, cheaper, some some differentiation. So that's the premise of what I'm going to do. Um, a couple, some, some facts for you. And these are, these are interesting. Probability of succeeding, average entrepreneur, 10%. 10%. OK? Most commonly started type of investment or, or company is a restaurant. People start restaurants because they probably like to cook. And a lot of people eat three meals a day. And if I do the math real quickly, there's 310, 320 million people in the United States, three meals a day, a billion meals served a day in, in the US alone. If I get 0.000001% of a billion dollars, I can retire, OK? Surest way to ruin a good hobby is trying to turn it into a profit-making business. Don't go in the restaurant business unless you are a pro at starting a restaurant and have run one before, OK? Stick with what you know. Second thing is, if you look at venture-backed startups, and the definition here is a team with domain knowledge, meaning they have a good business education and or experience. They are doing something they know how to do. It's not somebody who worked at McDonnell Douglas going and starting McDonald's franchise. It's not somebody who worked at General Electric getting in the software business. Okay? They know what they, they know, they have 10 or 20 years experience in a particular domain, and um, they have sufficient capital to get the first release out. Sufficient capital is not infinite capital. Sufficient capital means if an investor gives you a check, essentially, this is a rule of thumb, Half that check's going to building the product, and half that check is going to sell and market the product. OK? So get this technology perfection stuff out of your head. It needs to work, barely, but you need to tell people what it is. And most people love the technical part of getting it to work, and they hate the telling people what it is. OK, that's not me. I'm not good at that. Well, guess what? If you're going to play in today's world, you've got to toot your own horn, OK? For example, what is the most reliable operating system in the universe right now? Anybody want to guess? It's actually the, uh, the, the uh, operating system on the two Mars rovers. Never gone down. Install base of two units, OK? What's the worst operating system in the world today? Windows, 90% share, 90% share, OK? So I don't want to hear anything more about technical perfection or not having to market, OK? 
So now if we jump, again, so 10% probability of success, average entrepreneur, control for a few things, arguably most, most of you in the room have a 20% likelihood of success factor. Now remember, in a startup, likelihood of success means your first product or service works. If it doesn't, you're dead, okay? So company working means product sells. If you jump into big companies, the General Electrics, the Southwest Airlines of the world, 35% of their products succeed. Definition of success is three years after it's launched, it's still there. Case in point, I live in Austin, Texas. I drove down to San Antonio. You get anywhere near San Antonio, Southwest Airlines has billboards ringing the city as you come in, new nonstop, San Antonio to St. Louis, okay? So Southwestern Airlines knows, based on their indirect route to St. Louis, or believes there's demand for a nonstop from San Antonio to St. Louis. They think there's demand. Their approach is simple. They spend three months cutting the price on that nonstop and gaining share. Okay, they lose a little bit of money for a given period of time. They've done this many times. They know the approach. Then they let it float to full market rate after three months, and they'll give it another three months. And if the route's profitable, they'll keep it. And if it's not profitable, they'll shoot it. And they're not going to put out a press release that they shot it. You can still get from San Antonio to St. Louis. You're just going to have to stop somewhere on the way. Okay? So they are brutally efficient at this kind of thing. As an entrepreneur, you have to do the same stuff. If you want the pessimistic view, I just reversed the numbers up there. So I'm, I tend to be an optimist. And then if you extrapolate this to the U.S. economy, look at all in the R&D spent today. That means R&D on failed products in the United States is basically a quarter of a trillion dollars a year. So like Oak Ridge, like University of Tennessee, like anyone at this conference, if you can find a way to get that number more productive, you are gonna be a rock star and a hero and, and do very, very well. So the question is, how can we get that better? And this is a very timely subject, okay? This is the next big thing coming in the U.S. Listen to what the president, any, either candidate said, thank goodness it's over. Um, they were all pushing technology commercialization. All universities are pushing technology commercialization. All government labs are pushing technology commercialization. If you can figure this out and get good at this and beat the 20% odd, okay, if you can be 5% better than 20%, you've got a pretty good career ahead of you. Okay, so why is the failure rate so high? It's not about the technology. It's not about the manufacturing process, the accounting, the operations, all that kind of stuff. Most entrepreneurs, they start a company, they get all excited, they run down to Staples and think, oh my goodness, I saved 20% on the envelopes, okay? And then they call up the copier salesman and they abuse the copier salesman and they get 10% off the copier. And then they go, you know, negotiate with the landlord and save 3% on the lease. And, uh, and those are things that are easy to do, they make you, give you a sense of accomplishment at the end of the day. I got news for you, it has nothing to do with being successful. Absolutely nothing. You want that kind of stuff done, you, fire, you hire a young, hungry, just out of college undergrad with a dagger in his or her teeth. You pay them as little as you can, you give them as much stock as you can, and you get them to go out and do all that easy work that, that you got to watch out by getting sucked into. Okay? I, I feel good when I check 10 things off my to-do list too, but that's not what a startup's about. This is, this is the stuff that doesn't matter. Okay? It's important to running the company, there's no question about it, but it has nothing to do with the success of the company. Okay? A little bit on why that is. I find sort of this slide's broken into two, three parts. Top half, companies like to focus on operational issues. Right? We like to go down and see what's happening, we like to count things, we like data. You look at any business education, it's all about give me the numbers and I'll give you the answer. Okay? Give me a marketing budget and I'll figure out how much to spend on advertising. Give me the quality assurance data and I'll figure out where the problem is. You know, give me the supply chain stuff and I'll improve it, okay? That's commodity stuff. I'm not saying it's easy, but there's lots of people you can get to do that after you got a couple sales under your belt, okay? After you've sold some stuff. Get the customers in line first. I'm gonna tell you how. 
Don't worry, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what to do. We'll get to how to do it. Um, and companies don't, don't, or products don't fail because of technical things. I mean, listen, nobody ships a time, a budget, on <laughs> a budget. Nobody ships a product or service on time, on budget, at the desired quality, with the desired feature sets. Big corporations don't do that, regardless of what their press releases say. Startups never do. Okay, so it's not going to be perfect, but get something out there. Get a customer to open their wallet and part with their money. So if you look at the data, and I spent a lot of time on this, and I did a dissertation research on it, 85% of product failure can be tracked back to market-related issues. This means, gosh, I thought if I shipped 20% more features than my competitors, I could, I could take share. This means, oh, I've got a superior product with better technology, I can charge more. This means I didn't understand the distribution channel. This means I spent all the money developing the product, I had nothing left for sales and marketing. Okay? Most of the time, it's the market-related side of the equation that's wrong and causes failure. Okay, so, great, Rob. You're telling me a bunch of stuff I think I believe. Two examples. How many know what the Iridium phone system was? Okay? Particularly if we have any, anyone here from the government or ex-military, Iridium phone system, technological marvel. Okay, that upper right-hand globe, it's, a, it's uh, satellites rotating the globe quickly and essentially you could whip out this phone here in Knoxville. The simple version is it would find a satellite over, over us, <clears throat> relay that signal to wherever it needed to go in the world and beam the signal back down to the earth. Okay? Motorola spent $8 billion and a lot of years perfecting this system. Motorola is a great engineering company, really good at this kind of stuff, really good at radio wave transmission and things like that. They got Bill Gates to put his money in. They got AT&T to put them, his money in. I'm sorry, their money in. They got all the major telecoms. Patents filed. Unbelievable product, okay? Mistargeted it. Targeted at international business travelers thinking international business travelers would pay $30 a minute for a phone call, okay? Not only that, the thing didn't work that well. Didn't work indoors, okay? Um, had very, very long propagation delay, okay? A lot of technical things that would have been easy to figure out beforehand. Lots of good patents filed, lots of really cool technical problems fixed. Market failure, utter failure, nine months after spending $8 billion and went into bankruptcy, okay? It, just, it was just overkill. Engineering perfection, market failure. Let's look at that thing on the bottom, the Apple iPod. That's the first iPod that was shipped in 2001. No real technical breakthroughs. Battery from a laptop, storage device from a laptop, cool pinwheel design, definitely got the Apple foo-foo dust in it that sort of causes you to lose your sanity whenever you get near it. Um, but really, really well designed. First one was of terrible quality. It's about the size of a pack of cigarettes. Wall Street hammered the company. They said, Steve Jobs, you don't know what you're talking about. You sell these $1,000 high margin machines to big companies, and you're going to sell a device the size of a pack of cigarettes for 400 bucks to teenagers who steal music from the internet. Have you lost your mind? Okay. Now, when they told him this, the stock was at $8.78. Needless to say, they went on to market this correctly. They targeted a small initial group of users, which were the Apple converted in the music industry. That was their first target. They didn't do what Iridium did and try to go to everyone. Second target was they added a Windows interface to an Apple product, unheard of, complete hearsay in, inside Apple, but expanded the market by a factor of 10. Final thing, they added iTunes. Product took off, risk-adjusted price today, is somewhere around six or seven hundred dollars. Okay, more than a hundred to re, hundred to one return in a course of about twelve years. Okay, so Apple hundred one to return, um, Iridium actually hundred to one loss, eight billion dollars bought out of bankruptcy for eighty million dollars. So when you think product, think about how Apple does stuff and how simply and elegantly it's positioned versus how Iridium does stuff. Iridium could not come up with a one-sentence position for what they did. It was all things to all people. 
Apple came up with real simple positioning. It said, it's a thousand songs in your pocket. That was it. All the cool stuff it did, they boil it down to a thousand songs in your pocket. So, all right. All right, you set up the problem. Now, how do I do it? Okay, here's how you do it. I'm going to talk to you about this. I'm going to show you an example of real stuff. Um, so, first of all, what I talk about all over the world with big companies, with small companies, with foreign governments, with groups like this all the time is a process I call market validation. I figure out in the startups I'm involved with or the big companies I work with whether there's demand for a product or service before any money is spent uh, building that product or service. Okay? If I'm going to put real money into something, I want to know there's demand for it. How do I figure that out? Here's where you're going to get outside your comfort zone. I call 100 customers before I do anything. Anything. Okay? I call them up. I don't tell them what I'm doing. I ask them if they have the problem I'm fixing. And if they have the problem I'm fixing, how do they fix it today? And what products or services do they use? And what are their favorite brands? And what are the three favorite things about the way they fix it, that brand that fixes it today? And what are the three least favorite things? And who buys it? And who uses it? And who maintains it? And who installs it? All different questions you've got to know the answers to. Okay? So I can, <clears throat> for about 5% of the marketing, of the development budget, figure all this stuff out in about 60 days. And believe me, I'd rather know in 60 days and, let's say, on a development project of, of half a million dollars, 60 days and 25 grand, I can give you an answer. I'd rather know in 60 days and 25 grand whether I want to spend the rest of that money or not. And by the way, if there's no market there, move on to the next market. There's probably one close by it. Okay? Now, technical people do this all the time. They test, they validate, they ensure, they make sure when it goes out the door it's going to work. Why don't we do it in sales and marketing? Why? Okay, why? Because I probably just scared you by saying 100 phone calls. Who am I going to call? Who's going to make the calls? What's going to happen? If you're an entrepreneur, you are making these calls. This is no different than what your sales organization is going to face a year or two from now when the product's available. Okay, so what is it? It's a, it's a structured process applied to the rather serendipitous, serendipitous task of doing a complete evaluation for the market before the product or service is built. Okay? It's a series of standard business practices using an objective, market-oriented, and fact-based data collection process. For example, if I go to a market researcher today, and I'm in the tea business, okay, and I say, hey, I want to sell tea in the United States. I want to find out the answer to a simple question. Should I sell hot tea or cold tea? So the market researcher goes out, surveys the U.S., probably comes back with data that looks something like this. If I draw a line along the snow belt, northern half the country wants hot tea. Southern half the country wants iced tea. So what would a market researcher tell you to ship? Warm tea. Right? Half the world wants it hot, half the world wants it cold, ship it warm. Okay? The reality of the matter is nobody wants it warm. On average, they want it warm. They either want it hot or cold. You've got to pick which market to go in first. So that's what you've got to watch out about typical market research. And again, the complete process, 60 days, roughly 5% of your development budget, roughly. Okay? So the philosophy behind market validation is that success is achieved through a series of fast failures. Remember 20% likelihood of success? It's only 20% and I can find out in 60 days where it is or roughly where it is. It's not going to have, you know, there's going to be some interpretation involved here. That's good. I can fail in 20 days and still maintain my startup status. Conversely, if I pick something and spend three or four years raising money and, 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 and killing myself to get it out the door, I'll never get that time back, I'll never get that reputation back. I could do that two or three or four times using this process, spend very little money, and eventually get to a product that I knew the market would accept. 
There's three steps to what I'm going to talk to you about. Ready, aim, and fire. Um, ready, quick triage of your idea for, your entre for you entrepreneurs out there. Spend a weekend doing this before you quit your day job. It'll be a good assessment. That's how entrepreneurs use it. I use it with a lot of big, um, large industrial fortune class companies based around the world. When they have multiple opportunities they're looking at, Ready is a great way to standardize all of them. There's a company I'm working with in the oil field, uh, 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 in the oil and gas and uh, manufacturing business. Every year we take about a dozen of their best ideas. We figure out which ones are the top three or four based on this process, and they go pursue them for new products. Okay, they commercialize their technology that way. So again, fast effort, uh, fast work, about two days worth of effort. AIM is a far more involved process. If you've passed the ready stage, you're ready for AIM. AIM is when you make 100 phone calls. Okay, 100 live interviews, no electronic, nothing. Okay, I want to hear the person. I want to hear the oohs, the ahs. I hate that. I love this. Let me give you a good example. I worked with a, a team from IBM, senior executives. They were start doing a new startup. They knew everything about the space they were going into, which was systems management. They knew it cold. And I convinced them to, to go out and validate three products. The product that was the one they went with and was very successful then, for them, it was real simple. They called 100 people in their target audience, IT managers. They asked them the following questions. Number one, where does most, and this was IT managers in Fortune 100 accounts, so the biggest of the big. Okay? Always important to articulate what market you're going after. Fortune 100, number one, in your information technology budget, where do you spend most of your money? The answer was people. Second question, where are most of your people? This was about 2001, 2002 when we did this. Answer, help desk. Go down to the help desk. What are most of the people on the help desk doing? Anybody want to guess? Internal, this is internal help. Resetting passwords, okay? Fortune 100, 200 companies, Massive deployments of SAP, uh, Salesforce. At the time, PeopleSoft was, I think, an independent company. The, the, the typical Fortune class person had a dozen en uh, enterprise applications. And of course, they all wrote their username and password down on a post-it note and stuck it under their keyboard, thinking nobody would know where to get it. So it, basically, the quick version is we went and automated that password reset process. It had several problems. It took a week or two to get a new person into the system. It took that long for their credentials to proliferate. If I had to do a reset, it involved about eight to 10 calls back and forth to the help desk, okay, to get everything right. And these were not easy to use applications like the ones we're used to as consumers. Third problem was if an employee is fired, Inside IT organizations, that's where all the disgruntled things happen. It took a long time to get their credentials out of the system. Fourth thing that was on the horizon that, closed, that really caused this product to take off, this was before you could get to your bank and insurance accounts online as external consumers, okay? We asked them, what's going to happen, Chase Manhattan Bank, Wells Fargo, Travelers Life Insurance, when your hundreds of thousands of customers need to reset their passwords. And by the way, you have their money. What do you think their level of anxiety is going to be? Okay? These guys were experts, five of them in the field. Never would have guessed that without going through this process. Talk about competitive differentiation from the other conversation. We found competitive differentiation by doing those 100 interviews. Okay? Company took six months validating three different products two months apiece, was in business for about three and a half years, raised about $15 million, sold the company to Sun for $160 million, basically four years from the day they left IBM to the day the check cleared from Sun. And by the way, if you know Sun, we got it in cash, not stock, so everything was fine. Okay? And then fire is the art of making sure the last step, everything we did in Ready and Aim gets done. Big companies, 
consulting projects, good work gets done, stuck on the shelves, nothing ever happens, okay? A lot of times you've got to make sure that uh, things happen. So let me go ahead and ask the, uh, my PowerPoint friend here to switch over. I'm going to show you a real report. Data in this report is true. The name of the company has been changed. Let me give you the background, okay? Because I know you're saying, oh, yeah, this sounds wonderful. Sure, sure, sure. Let me show you some data. Um, so first of all, this was a startup company that built a system that enabled people in the paint and coatings business who made paints and coatings to buy their raw ingredients in a more efficient way. Okay? If you look at uh, how paint's made, Sherwin-Williams, Rust-Oleum, any of the big paint makers, they say, hey, we're going to make bright orange, rust-proof paint for bridges in saltwater conditions. We're going to repaint the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay? They go, they test, they do small batch runs of formulations. They might test a dozen different formulations. They decide it's formulation number nine, and they go and scale up production on number nine. Paint has about 60 ingredients. Pigments, emulsifiers, stabilizers, rust inhibitors, all kinds of stuff. When they go to buy the stuff, it's really hard to figure out what the best source is, what the best quality is. This team came from that industry. They basically built a subscription-based model. You had to pay money to use this that made it easier for paint suppliers to figure out who they're, who they're, where, where they should get their supply from. Okay? So it's what we call a two-sided market, technically, in internet speak. The paint, paint manufacturers over here and the suppliers of raw ingredients over here. So you've got to figure out how to be the middleman in that. Okay, that's what this was. <clears throat> Did market validation for the, for the paint part of it. Went really well. Went out and raised some venture capital with that. Company got up to about $12 million in three years. Very, very good for a startup company. Okay. $12 million in three years. They found a problem. They don't worry about the technology. Once they found the problem, they backed into the technology. Okay, that was rocking and rolling. They went out and raised some more venture capital to go after the next big market, right? You do it once, you should be able to do it again. I went back to them and said, let's do the market validation. They said, oh, no, 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 Rob, we got it this time. We know what we're doing. Go away. I said, fine, call me when you need me. So they looked at a similar market, believe it or not, food and beverages. Okay? I hate to say this, but food and beverages is made pretty much the same way paint is. Okay? There's a new formulation of peanut butter. They go out and test it. They figure out, hey, it's formula, uh, formula letter B3. Okay? And then they go buy the raw ingredients. Now, the raw ingredients are much better tested. They have to be certified, you know, depending on which country you're selling them on. So there's a lot more regulation on the supply side of it, which makes it more expensive. There's a lot more food sold than there is paint sold. So they thought, oh, this is easier. We're going to kill this. We are absolutely going to kill this. And two years later, they had about a million dollars worth of revenue versus three years having $12 million in the first thing. They came back and said, okay, what did we do wrong? This is an example of what market validation uncovers. Had they done it this way to begin with, it would have been a different story. I'm going to point to a few highlights in this report, okay? I'm going to run through about five major slides this presentation is probably 40 pages long. All right, it's a consulting report. There's the agenda. We interviewed customers who had bought their current product, okay? They had some customers. They just didn't have enough of them. So we started with those. First thing, I know you can't read this, but pick up the phone. This is Rob Adams. I'm calling from, from Simon Management Company. And I'd like to know speak to the person who buys food ingredients today. Can you please connect me with them? That's all we said. That's all we said. And we have a long list of names, the names, the company names. Birdseye, ConAgra, Frito-Lay, General Mills, Gerber, Gortons, Heinz, Kraft, Land O'Lakes, Ocean Spray, Pepperidge Farm, Unilever, okay? These are big companies you know the name of. They answered the phone and, they, and we told them I'd like to take 20 minutes and ask you some questions. Are you okay with that? We got the company name, far left-hand column, department, interviewee name, and their title. The only interesting thing here is we got one department, and the department was would not say. 
that was the only person who wouldn't answer a question for us. They gave us their name, they gave us their title, but they didn't want to say what department they were in. A couple things you can't see from out there. First of all, big company names, which I mentioned. Far right-hand corner, all the job titles were either food technologists or food scientists. Those were our target market, okay? So all of a sudden, we know the kinds of companies, we know the titles, and we, we know that we have multiple food groups inside existing companies. A place like Heinz has multiple versions of them. A place like Unilever has multiple versions of them. Okay, I'm just going to move through this quickly. First thing the company was saying was, hey, you know, we're not, our salespeople aren't calling in the right place. So well, what do you mean? Well, you know, in the paint business, you're either in new paint development and buying ingredients, or you're in existing paint development and, and testing to make sure you're still getting a good price on the ingredients. We're not calling on the right people. I said, oh yeah, we asked them a question. Do you work on formulation for new products, existing products, or both new and existing products? 90% of the time, they worked on both new and existing products. The company had it wrong. The customers told us. Okay, 90% of the time. The company didn't know that. They thought they were really good at what they were doing. They had no idea about this. How big is your group? The assumption was, how many people are in your group? The assumption was, oh, it's big companies, you know, we're going to have 100 people in a team. No, the reality was, if you look at that light blue slice on the right, 50% of the time it was five people or less on a team. So the next thing we learned is lots of diffuse groups of people. There might be 50 groups of five people spread around the world doing this kind of work, and they usually don't talk to each other. All of a sudden, we're building a much different product. If we were selling one product to Unilever in Europe that was going to be used by hundreds of people and supported at headquarters, that's a much different product than building a product that was going to be used by uh, three people at 50 different locations across 24 time zones. Totally different product. Totally different support model. Right? Unknown to the company. I'm going to blast through here for a minute. Okay. What you see here on the left is a list of five features. What you see there on the right is a list of another 12 features. The company put all 17 of these features in the first release. Okay, it took them forever. One of the things I'm going to talk about is minimal viable product set. 17 features. The top, top two, 90% of the people wanted. We tested this. Next two, 75% of the people wanted. Fifth product down. You can see that bottom bar graph, 25% of the people wanted it. Why'd you build all 17 when four people, when four features are desired by 75% 75, 75 of the group and all the other features one or two people want? Okay? You talk about a minimal viable product, I would have put the top two or maybe the top four features in, shipped it in three or six months, and gotten money for it, and then gone back and seen if these would work. They spent too much time putting all this stuff into the product. How do we find this out? We picked up the phone. We didn't tell them who we were. I mean, we were a consulting company. We didn't use, we weren't a company. And we didn't tell them what we were doing. We just asked them how they did this today. We didn't offer them anything yet. OK, then we said, what do you need to do your job today? We got, there's a whole bunch of bar graph data here. I apologize for the art chart nature. Um, let me go quickly. I'm going to move through a few more things here. Okay. We then read the solution description. Okay. I'll let you read it. It's a little long-winded. But if you were a startup and you didn't have a product yet, you could make up a product with three sentences. Okay. You talk to any sales or marketing person, they got three sentences to say what's going on. You go to someone's website, they got three sentences to grab your attention. This is sufficient. I've done 50 of these projects. This is all you need. And if it's not working, rewrite the paragraph and start over. So we said, we read them this description, and we didn't say, would you buy it? Or we didn't say, how much money would you pay for it? We simply said, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think? Okay. Far left-hand corner is one, 
far right hand corner is 10, left hand corner not interested, uh, left hand side not interested, right hand side very interesting. You see there's a sort of a, a skewed normal distribution curve way over to the right. Average, eight, average value on the bottom there was 8.3 out of 10. Okay, You need about a 7.0 or better in a US market to have a successful product. There was the answer to a successful product. Calling the target audience and asking them. And by the way, if you got two or three products, use two or three descriptions. And after each one, say on a scale of 1 to 10, how does that work? On a scale of 1 to 10, how does that work? On a scale of 1 to 10, how does that work? Not do you, buy, do you want it and how much would you pay for it, OK? You will not get good answers using that kind of technique. OK, a few other things. Interesting, people contradict themselves. Top question is how many times you think you'd access it. The answer is 1.9 times per week. Bottom question is how many times uh, a week would you download technical information. The answer was 3.1 times a week. So although they'd only access it twice a week, they'd take stuff down from it three times a week. Just an example of you get contravailing information, you got to go in and sort of fix it. It's your job to know what the customer's saying, not their job to know what they're saying. OK, just, uh, OK. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this presentation with this slide, just speak for a few minutes on it. This was the reason they were unable to sell their product. This one question said why the current product wasn't working as well as they had hoped. What percentage of your potential suppliers need to be on the site to use it regularly? In the paint business, the answer was 40%. In the food business, the answer is, if you take all this in, is 66% um, of the time I need half to all my suppliers, if you look at the two right-hand green ones, okay? 66% of the time, I need almost everybody there. At the time, they had about 25% of the suppliers. That's why people were not using the product. Now, there's a whole bunch of other usability reasons within that I don't have time to get into, but once you know that's the issue, you can begin to ask more and more questions about that issue. Okay, can we go back to the, uh, the main presentation? Okay, so the whole idea behind showing you that is I'm not pontificating some esoteric structure that is not practically usable. It is very, very usable. And if the thought of making 100 phone calls makes you squirm in your seat, and you go, who's going to do that? And I say, you're going to do that. And you say, where am I going to get the names? I'm going to say, you're going to get the names the same place your sales and marketing force is going to get the names a year or two from now when your product's available. Okay? If that intimidates you, don't do this. So how can we sort of wrap this up and, and think about how it applies in the context of tech commercialization? I'm trying to get you outside your comfort zone here. I want you to think about market opportunity first, the solution second. Okay? Remember what an investor wants. They want a compelling market opportunity and a smart team that will go figure out technical or strategic or relationship or some form of competitive advantage that lets them thrive in the marketplace. That's how tech commercial and commercialization has to be done. Um, I've been working at the University of Texas in Austin for about the last six years. We have an a, a organization I run called Texas Venture Labs. We work with these kinds of companies all the time, commercializing technology. We use this approach. Okay? We do not have any money ourselves. We don't want to have any money to invest. That's dangerous if we're both the people helping the companies and investing the companies. Uh, since we started it, we've been through 50 companies to date. And the last data I have, which is about a month old right now, about 44% of the companies we worked with raised funding from outside sources, independent sources. So sources that knew the domain and were investors. We use this as a cornerstone to how we evaluate these problems. From this, we build some kind of prototype or some kind of product and get it in the market. I'm going to take questions in just a minute because I know you have some. But let me just close with, I know you think it's hard here in eastern Tennessee getting venture capital without customers. 
It's no harder here than it is anywhere else in the United States. Okay? You've got to show demand. You've got to show compelling demand. You've got to start with the market opportunity because investors want big markets. They don't want great doodads. Okay? They want big markets that are then fixed with technologically innovative things, good intellectual property with really good protection. So if you could just jump to the end slide for me, all the way down there, I think control end will get you there. Um, again, all the material that I've talked to you about or the process I've talked to you about is covered in the book. It's $15 out in the lobby. Um, uh, my website is up here if you want to get in touch with me. If you have any questions, I'm going to open up to Q&A. But again, if you like what you heard, take the 15 bucks in exchange for you buying the book. Someday I'll buy you a beer or a cup of coffee. That's my commission plan. And instead of re losing $2 a book I wrote, I'll lose about 3 or $4 a book I wrote. But, so let me, let me ask you, go ahead, come up, and I'd love to take a, uh, some questions. Sean, what do we've got? About another five, ten minutes to get us? Okay. Any questions? You believe everything I've said. Please, please step up to the microphone. I'm, I'm being sarcastic. I'm sorry. Please step up to the microphone. I'll be glad to answer. So, hello. Um, so, let's say you get an investor. At what point do you accept them? not to relinquish power, the control of your company. Okay, get over this control thing. If you have an outside investor, they control your company. Period. End of statement. I can own 1% of your company and own 100% of what you do. Okay? If you do not want to give up control, do not raise outside capital. I, I run into this all over, all over the place. This is venture capital. These are large sums of money. You might be good looking, you might be really, really smart, but the US securities laws protect the investor and give the investor many rights that you and your attorney will be fully aware of when you close that deal, okay? So if you want to maintain 100% control, don't take anyone's money. If you have an opportunity that's compelling enough, that needs development, time, and effort, and you need to take somebody's money to do that, they are going to exert, not control, but they're going to exert oversight. They're in the business of making money. They want you selling those hot dogs, okay? This is not, they don't fund science projects. They fund stuff that makes money. So again, you've got to be really, really careful about this. I'm very adamant about this. I go all over the world kind of myth-busting on this front. If, if your idea is really good, you should be able to sell something and maybe before you need investment and maybe never need investment. So. And again, part of raising money is going through this kind of process. If you can show the investor a reduced risk that you've got customers lined up and ready based on a particular opportunity, this is a great way to do it. I saw another hand up in the back. Here we go. So on the case study on food and bev, your N was significantly lower than 100. So does that mean that by, based on the industry, your N can change? And how do you figure out how big your N should be then? Good question. OK, so, so I said do 100 interviews. We had 30-odd uh, up there. We did a bunch of interviews that added up to about 120, okay? But we did them before you saw this round, which we narrowed it down. So think of the 100 interviews are a series of different interviews. Think of it as a pyramid. You start with the base, you ask a lot of people, you build up information, and as you get farther and farther into the process, you get narrower and narrower, and this represented the more narrow end of the market, okay? We really were honing on, on the, in on the people who used it and needed it. Please. So we've already built something that works. So uh, fire. <laughs> At this point, I assume our job is to figure out what it takes to sell it to somebody? Yes. <laughs> yes. And I work with a lot of companies in that state. 
I mean, the problem is, is it sellable? Let me give you an example. Uh, Iridium, uh, when they launched, in the nine months they lived, they went through three complete sales and marketing organizations. The thought being that the sales and marketing people didn't know what they were doing, okay? The reality was the product was not right for the market. So you've got two options. One is if you get lucky and it works, good for you. The other is you can do this process still by going after the target market you think you have. And then if that does not prove to meet what your current product is, you can go see if there is a market where your current product offering has a, has a stronger take. Thank you. Awesome. Rob, we'd love to have you here for a week sometime. I'll tell you what, uh, any, any of you that have ever been to any of our classes, uh, now you know where I got all this stuff from because it's straight out of his book and uh, this whole idea of market validation. So let me ask the panel, uh, the next panel, to, to make their way up. And again, guys, we need some help with microphones. Uh, and while they're coming, I'm going to give away some more stuff. So 